outside the box. Avant-garde cocktails. Thank you so much for getting up this morning. I know we've all had a fun few days and fun few nights for sure. Uh, thanks for being bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Hope the hip-hop got you excited. Um, for a really fun presentation, I've got an amazing panel of uh, experts in their field to share some really great information with you. Um, and my name is Summer Jane Bell. I'm going to be moderating today. My business card is in front of you as well as a um, postcard for my app, Trophy Cocktail. Um, I'm going to give you a little run of show first before I introduce the panelists. Um, I'm going to go through a brief history of how we got to where we are today as far as cutting edge techniques over the last 15 years or so. Um, and then uh, we're going to have break it down into three main sections, exotic ingredients, technique, and uh, conceptual drinks. And then we're going to tie it all together with a really fun kind of interactive exercise at the end. So um, I, I don't want it to be just kind of cocktail porn and things that you might find kind of unapproachable or, or difficult to imagine yourself doing an avant-garde cocktail. We're really going to try and break it down so everybody can take away some cool techniques today or some ideas and uh, make something really unique in your own bar, uh, whether that be at home or in your, in your program, whether you can afford expensive equipment or not. So that's the goal of today. Um, we've got a bite in front of you, which is made by Micah Melton of the Aviary. Uh, you can eat it whenever you like. It's um, Angostura aromatic bitters with chocolate, mint, and coconut. And we have a cocktail coming up once Michael comes on stage. Um, it's going to be a really fun conceptual drink that uh, it was a collaborative effort of all of us, actually. And um, just uh, P.S., it's not vegetarian. So if we have any vegetarians in the house, you might want to steer clear of the cocktail. I'm sorry in advance. <laughs> um, I, quick shout out to the Caps. I'm so uh, grateful that they were really able to work with us. Thank you, Cam. We asked them to do some things that were a little outside the box, so uh, I'm extra appreciative. And I also really want to thank our sponsor today, House of Angostura, um, which uh, had the rums and the bitters in the cocktail and also in our bite. Um, I'm their national brand, sorry, West Coast brand ambassador. Um, I wear many hats, and uh, I, I'm really grateful that they <coughs> let me do this idea without putting any really brand information. So we're not going to be talking about rum or bitters or Trinidad at all. Um, and they really trusted me um, to just do a presentation on like a really unique topic that, that I think is really on trend. So thanks, Angostura. Uh, so my rock star panel, I've got Michael Callahan here. He's visiting from Singapore. He's going to be talking about... He uh, moved over to Singapore in around 2011 and has been consulting on um, programs all over Asia. He's a really innovative um, technique and uh, ingredient guy and I'm just really pleased. And we've been friends for so long, so yep. he really helped me put together this panel as well and introduced me to some of the other folks. So thanks, Michael. Thanks for being here. Always. <laughs> we have Micah Melton from the Aviary. Woo! Total badass. He started the program there with Charles Joe Lee as the ice chef and has now moved on to beverage director. So he's going to be talking about some really cool cutting edge things that they're doing now at the aviary that you might not be aware of. And then we've got Elliot Ball of Cocktail Trading Company in London. Um, we're new friends. We actually met in Edinburgh at Tales on Tour in April. And um, he's very witty and he's got some really fun conceptual drinks to share with you. <laughs> And then finally, we have uh, Dan Daniel Nevsky. Yay! <laughs> all of the class. <laughs> He's currently with Cocktails for You, traveling all over the world, guest bartending on the Vagabond Project, a uh, different month um, at each bar in each country. He's been recently in Kazakhstan. Um, he's got some crazy stories from there. Uh, and <laughs> all over the world. And so, wives. Um, <laughs> He's just a really fun guy, and I, I um, encourage you to meet all of us personally afterwards so we can all stay in touch. But I'm just so honored to be able to have these guys up on stage with me. So thanks so much. Here's all our handles. If you want to take a quick pic, if you're going to post anything, um, I'm really into social media, and I really appreciate uh, if you guys do post something on it. So what makes a cocktail avant-garde? Well, the key words really are experimental, unorthodox, and radical. So we're going to be talking about cocktails that 
are outside the box today and, and how you can incorporate those techniques at home. The three main elements that we're going to focus on are um, exotic and bespoke ingredients, innovative technology, and conceptual drinks and menus. Um, I think this cocktail is incredibly innovative. They made a tincture out of old books, so they collected books from 1940 and previous, um, soaked them in grapeseed oil, fat washed it into a tincture, and then use it in this cocktail, and then it's served out of a flask from a book. So that's an um, incredible concept and very unique bespoke ingredient at the same time from the Columbia Room in DC. So really started happening more um, on the chef side in molecular gastronomy in the early 2000s. And uh, as bartenders were working on these programs as well, they started incorporating these really innovative techniques from the kitchen into drinks. We're going to be going through this chronology. So now we're around 2003, a very early program was WD-50, uh, the first to fat wash, the first to come up with like chartreuse gummy bears and Angostura aromatic bitters, marshmallows, um, and the clarification of citrus. Uh, this is a really unique cocktail called Clouds Over San Juan. It's basically a pina colada, but since xanthan gum is whipped into it and it's carbonated, um, as you drink the, the, the um, cocktail, the carbon dioxide escapes and bubbles up, so it actually rises. The wash level rises as you drink it down. So that's really thinking outside the box. 2007, we have um, Eben moving over to Taylor and use, really starting to play around with cocktails and soda guns and things on draft and smoking things, and he's very famous for the Whalen cocktail. Uh, unnamed at 69 Colbrook Row, uh, very innovative spot, uh, very influential because they had an apprentice program. Um, I actually went to the bar in depth of Quinnery yesterday and learned that the, um, the owner there was in the apprentice program and used a lot of the techniques um, to bring to Asia and to Hong Kong. So this is a really pivotal point. Um, Columbia Room was one of the first omakase style programs where um, there's a, a set experience in advance. The guest is not just going to order one drink. There's a, a tailored kind of theatrical experience for them where uh, it's also paired with really unique bites. Um, this one incorporates aquafaba, which is very trendy now. Night Jar in London, really starting to do conceptual serves and exotic ingredients at the same time, I'm sure. This is, this is the cocktail porn section <laughs> of the presentation. Um, Clyde Common was the first uh, age barrel age cocktails. We're going to be talking a lot about the aviary. I'm going to leave that up to Micah, but I just wanted to kind of put this in the time frame. We're down at 2011, um, where it's really starting to have the chefs and the bartenders working together. Also, um, in, a, in a setting where you don't sit at the bar, everything happens kind of behind the scenes, so a lot of their drinks are very um, interactive and theatrical at, at the table side. Um, to put it in perspective, this is when Michael moved to um, Singapore and started 28 Hong Kong Street. Still in 2011, we've got um, Dave Arnold, who was French Culinary Institute's Director of Culinary Technology, um, coming up with some really cool new techniques. Uh, he's famous for the Sears All, the Cocktail Cube, the new tabletop centrifuge we're all so excited that's about to release, the Spins All. Um, he's really... <coughs> Correcting the acid in orange juice, I think, is a really interesting um, concept that he did, too. So you can add, it, add extra citric acid so you can use it like a lemon or a lime in a cocktail. That was quite clever. Simple, but really clever. We've got more equipment, more laboratory equipment happening in these days now, 2013. Uh, this Ramos Gin Fizz in the center, um, the gin was actually put through the Sonic Prep, which is this uh, device on the side which, which emits um, like uh, transmits uh, radio waves and really a lot of sonic waves to inf rapid infuse the vanilla into the gin. 2015, the first cocktail training company is opening with Elliot, who's going to talk more about these, but I love this drink, the Sauvignon Private Ryan. Uh, it's just a really fun name, and obviously the serve is, is really a special too. <laughs> Here's some other programs that I personally find really inspiring. I'm excited to go to the bar in depth of Mace. This is a very ingredient-driven program. Um, I think the menu is so beautiful as well. Um, I'm inspired by the Walker Inn. I live in San Francisco, so I get to go down to Los Angeles frequently and visit these guys. This is one of their menus. Their current menu, which just launched a couple weeks ago, um, has my friend Johnny Codd at the helm now. Um, and it's, 
it's a, a day at sea and the first cocktail is dawn and then there's noon and then the afternoon and the evening. So just thinking about time and putting the guest in another, having a completely different experience from where they are sitting in the room through you know, multi-sensory uh, cocktails, I think is, is really awesome. And then I'm gonna finish off my, my fun cocktail porn with uh, Gracias Madre's um, CBD cocktails. I just love this um, churro in a dime bag as a garnish. <laughs> it's so clever. Um, and the sour teasel and the puff puff pass, Doni Negroni. So yeah, I just wanted to show you kind of where we've come from, who are some of the key players, and then we're gonna talk about the specific elements of an avant-garde cocktail. Um, a little bit more about myself, because I forgot to introduce myself, because uh, uh, I'm gonna give the mic to the rest of the guys. But um, yes, I live in San Francisco. I have the Trophy Cocktail Mobile App um, Ambassador for House of Vegas Store. But I'm also um, on the national board of the USBG. Um, we had our Toast at Tales last night. Uh, it's an organization that I'm um, very proud to be part of and very passionate about. So you guys all have my card. Um, if you have any questions about um, USBG, Angostura, or the app, I'd be really happy to stay in touch with you. So up next, we've got Michael Callahan, and he's going to really dig into what what means what exotic means, and um, and his perspective from working on cocktail programs in Asia, surrounded by things that are very exotic to us. So thank you. Come on up, Michael. All right. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for making it today. I know if you were at some of the parties last night, you were probably up quite late, so these uh, later in the week, early morning seminars tend to have a less attendance, but I see that we're quite full, so thank you very much for coming out. So I won't take up too much time, these guys have a lot to say. Really when you look at exotic ingredients, the question is exotic. What is exotic? Well, before we jump into where to find these exotic ingredients and how to use them, we should probably touch on the concept of exotic. So the definition of exotic is to originate in and characteristic of a distant foreign land. So keep that, that definition in mind. As I say, when you're, most of us here, if we order breakfast and we order scattered, smothered, covered, and topped, we know exactly what we're getting. But a lot of us who in this room don't know what that might mean will have your phone ready, looking forward to see something new and interesting. Just like if you're in Singapore, you wake up to breakfast to kaya toast and kopi, most of you don't know what that is. So really exotic to most people is just a matter of perspective. So the question then is, where do we find perspective? I love this picture. One man's trash is another man's treasure. So most easiest way to get perspective is through travel, right? Immerse yourself. Try to find as much opportunity to get outside of the box as you possibly can. When you're traveling, don't be afraid to try things. Sure, you'll get a little occasional upset stomach, but it's part of the journey. Look at how people are preparing these ingredients. How are they storing these ingredients? How are they serving these ingredients? Ask them questions, and if you have a translation issue, just try to absorb with your senses. You won't like everything, you won't, but you should at least try. So once you have a chance to do that, it really opens up the doors. But the problem is, many of us have busy lives. We don't have opportunity to travel. We have bars to run, families to raise. So how do you get the travel to come to you? How do you get exotic in your backyard? The best way is to start to reach out to communities. So I actually had to do that for things that I took for granted when I moved to Asia. I couldn't find Mexican spices. So I had to think about where am I gonna find these Mexican spices, just like many of you won't be able to find Indonesian or Malaysian ingredients. So the best way to do that is reach out to embassies. And that's what we did. We started calling embassies and asking them, do you have cultural cooking classes? If you don't, do you at least have any kind of festivities coming up? And if you don't have that, do you have maybe cookbooks or something that we could borrow? And at the very end of the day, if nothing else was available, we said, well, does anyone have a grandmother in town? That we, because everybody knows grandma makes the best, right? So is it, well, we can get a group of bartenders and chefs together and we'll pay someone's grandma to come out and teach us how to understand and how to use these really unique ingredients from your culture. And in doing so, you also build a nice sort of community base and you get to learn from them, which is quite really, really, really nice. So once you start building that network and you start getting an opportunity to understand how things are produced and you get a chance to talk to them and see it being made with their hands, how they've done it for generations, you start to learn how to really extract the flavors from these ingredients. Because all of us can order these ingredients online, but the best way to learn how to use it is by learning from someone who has done it their whole lives. Okay, so now we have the ingredients. Oh, I forgot about this one, yes. Sweets. With festivals and with ceremonies, uh, especially religious ceremonies and things for weddings and birthdays and etc., 
every culture has sweets, right? We all have candies and cakes that come along with those experiences. And that's really great for bartenders because confectionery notes translate easily into cocktails. Now, one thing to note when you start to experience and start to sort of try these new sweets, you'll realize that sweet means different things to different people. This is actually a menu from a very famous uh, sort of chain, if you will, of sweet shops in Hong Kong. They're usually in more rural neighborhoods or deep into the, the downtown neighborhoods where, where not a lot of tourists go. But if you'll notice down here towards number 402, glutinous rice with chicken. There is quite a lot of proteins and savory items that we would not ever consider being sweet, but they actually use it in dessert format. So the drink that you're going to have come out actually has chicken essence in it. We'll talk about that later if you have questions, as well as bird's nest soup. So if you're vegetarian, definitely don't have a cocktail. <laughs> but sweets are a really great way of getting into there and getting to try some of the various different uh, ingredients and different ways to use it. So, next, now we have an understanding of, oh, the cocktails are coming out. Great. I love the caps. Uh, so now we have an understanding of where to find usage of ingredients, where to get a list of new ingredients, right? We've, we've now, we've talked to the grandmothers, we've gone to the cultural experiences at the embassies, we've done everything we can, also universities sometimes if you are having a hard time, and Facebook groups. So we've, we've managed to compile an experience of ingredients, but how do we get our hands on these ingredients? That's always a problem. Sometimes these things are more difficult to get than others. So what I would suggest is tapping the mule train. Now that's what we say is tap the mule train. Once you've built this relationship with the people at the embassy or within these various different cultures, oftentimes they send someone home and on their way back they bring a suitcase back. Ah, yes, thank you so much. They bring a suitcase full of ingredients back. Tap that mule train. If there's a very unique ingredient, if you want pandan leaf or if you want bird's nest or if you want some sort of chicken essence, find out if someone's gonna go home and ask them if you can bring back a few for you as well. Now, a lot of these ingredients will be limited in supply, so it's quite nice that you'll be able to use it at least for a special, but if not, you might be able to then recreate the flavors to get a similar product that's more available, but still executes the, the final product that you're looking for. And we're gonna talk about that in just a second. So, when you start asking about, say I need to get bird's nest soup, which is great, right? We have bird's nest in this cocktail, don't be afraid to drink it. It's, it's actually really good, we had it this morning. <laughs> The caps had a killer job on it. But the bird's nest soup is very, very expensive. In this drink, we actually used bird's nest, uh, it's, a, it's like a soda, if you will. But bird's nest by itself has a very similar flavor to barley. So we were able to work with the caps to have a barley water recipe and also use some of the bird's nest soda. So we stretched out the use of our bird's nest without having to bring too much over. So you can get really creative at substituting and seeking similar varietals. But there's a few pitfalls to be mindful of when you're seeking similar varietals. Especially if you're ordering things online and you're asking a supplier to bring in something different for you, the last thing you want is to get a product in that you can't use, especially since these special orders are expensive. I've run through this a bunch of times. One of the pitfalls is same name, different plant. Ginseng is a good example of this. So Korean American ginseng is different from Siberian ginseng. It's not the same flavor profile. Another pitfall is same plant, different flavor. So for that you would have, say, ginger. Old ginger and young ginger are different flavors. Sure, you can kind of get away with using one or the other, but for more specific flavor profiles, if you're having a very hard time balancing a particular ginger flavor, you might want to be mindful of which one you're using. Is it old or is it young? Another pitfall is definitely going to be same plant, different name. In Asia, cilantro can be three different things. So really confusing there. Also things like goji berries are also wolf berries or what do you guys call eggplant aberg 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 aubergine? aubergine? What the hell? <laughs> so same name, different plant, same name uh, can be really confusing, right? Also translation issues. So be mindful of these things when you're working with some of the cultural groups trying to ask about ingredients. I went down the rabbit hole the first time in Singapore. English is an official language there. But I went down the rabbit hole trying to find licorice. I said, okay, they speak English, no problem. <coughs> so I'm going to go find licorice. And I went everywhere asking for licorice. That was a word not in their language, in the lexicon at all. They actually used the Chinese word for it. And I didn't know that until I had to ask some of the local staff. So there's all these pitfalls to be mindful of when you're looking for varietals and you're sourcing special ingredients. So also don't forget your culture. So this is quite fun. Sometimes when you start to deconstruct these cocktails and deconstruct these flavor profiles that you're learning and you're really excited about it, you for, you'll start to realize that a lot of ingredients are similar and a lot of recipes are similar to things we already know in Western culture. 
So this is Tahoe. So if you've ever been in the Philippines and the islands, they walk around with a guy with a metal stick and two big pots and in the morning at 8 a.m. and he's going, ooh, ooh, and you can hear it. And it's a <laughs> breakfast thing. You go and you give him some pesos and he gives you a cup. And really all it is is silken tofu with extremely burnt caramel sauce. I mean black like espresso bitter black. And then tapioca beads. But the silken tofu to me it just really had a custard uh, texture and almost flavor to it. So I thought, wow, I could almost get the same mouthfeel and same flavor from something we all know, just custard with caramel sauce. So sure, the custard is not silken tofu, but the concept, the mouthfeel, the flavors are so similar that I could just look at how am I making custard with caramel sauce and I can recreate the same flavors and textures of Tahoe. I don't want to be disrespectful to the dish, but I want to be able to offer something similar. So I will tell people usually, this isn't silken tofu, it's not actually traditional, but it gives you an idea. It gets you close to what you could possibly have. And then when you go to the Philippines, you should definitely try it. It'll wake you up. It's like pure sugar and protein. It will wake you up. Another really fun example of that is that this is ice kachang. Anyone who's ever been to Singapore knows this is one of the best cool desserts to have, especially since you're basically on the equator. And it's basically, if you look, it's just shaved ice with every topping known to man. That's red beans in the top left. I've had durian on it, gummy bears. There's a lime wedge shoved in one of them there. So in Asia, you can get any topping you could possibly think of on your ice kachang, which totally kicks the butt of our snow cones. But who doesn't love a snow cone, right? I mean, seriously, it's still a good drink. It's really, or a good dish, dish, treat, treat. So I like tiger's blood. Um, the cool thing is that you see these things and you're like, wow, okay, and then you can reverse it and bring it back to your culture. So instead of a snow cone at your next party or pool party, why not make ice kachang? You have a cultural story to tell. It's actually something that is served all the time. It's interesting, it's different, and it's hella good. But I have to admit, just on a side note, uh, in Asia they tend to embellish things uh, and they, they, they're really good at going the extra mile and making things colorful. As much as I do love mass transit that's clean and efficient, the buses in the Philippines totally kick our butt. <laughs> Am I already running out of time? No, you have five minutes. Oh, uh, okay. Cool. The clown horns are five minutes. Okay, okay. I'm yeah, the there's... time cop. Oh my god. The time okay. cop. So that's that's the, the more important stuff's coming up. Okay, so <laughs> ingredients. Now we have all the ingredients. We know how to get the ingredients. We know what they should taste like. So oh, that's wrong time. So next thing is then organizing. How do we organize it? <laughs> the best way to organize all of get all this knowledge and you're starting to <laughs> understand all these ingredients <laughs> and how to extract the flavors. Organize it in a way that makes sense to us bartenders. Break it down into the four ingredients of a cocktail, right? Sugar, water, bitters, spirit of any kind. So when you start going through things, start tasting new sugars. So this is actually Palmera palm sugar being made in Indonesia. You can get this throughout Asia quite easily, but it's the sugar, right? So as soon as I taste this, I put it in my little notebook of sweeteners along with agave and maple and cane. This is just the sugar. In Japan, you get these, which are really interesting, unique cane sugars. A few years ago, Camper did a wonderful sugar seminar. I don't know if anyone was there for that one. And we brought him a bunch of sugars from Asia. It was really fun. So here you have, of course, your coconut and your gula malaka. So this is uh, going to be a very common sweetener that you can use. Makes really great uh, in-depth flavors and sort of really weird kind of finishes on, say, like painkillers and pina coladas. Wow, nice good job. joke. That was, yeah, that was a, a good joke over there. So, also, when you travel, I know if you have friends traveling, if you're traveling, pick up as many of these things as you possibly can. So sodas, everyone has a different idea of what a tasty beverage is. So all over the world, you can get really cool canned drinks, and they are shelf-stable, and they can travel home with you. Cook these down into a syrup, draw these out into a long mixer, carbonate them. You know, once you find them, you can try to find a supplier, you can get them in at international groceries, etc. But have fun with these. These are a really great way and a really cheap way to start to play with new ingredients. So here you see basil seed drink, there's a grass jelly drink. Bottom right, you see the bird's nest, which is very popular and is in your cocktail. So as you see, there's different tasty beverages from around the world. So just be you know, out there and trying things. The other ingredient you have right, is bitter. So a bitter ingredient. A lot of traditional Chinese medicine is very bitter and can be used to great effect. It also has a good story. This bitter gourd, so try it. Even though you might have it in a liquid form, it's still bitter. And you can definitely use this in a Negroni to add some more depth and some new flavors. Also, of course, is the spirit of any kind. As you travel, try as many spirits and fermented drinks as possible. Every culture has a fermented drink, all of them, and most of them have a distilled drink. 
So this is Baijiu. If anyone's ever used it or had it before, you know it's a very assertive spirit. It definitely has a bit of a kick to it. Average 50 to, it's actually 50% or up. It's quite, it's got some kick and it's got some taste. So difficult to use, but fun and rewarding if you can get balance out of it. You have Iraqs from all over Southeast Asia. So they are also really interesting and very wildly. It's like the category of rum. You can just get almost a whole slew of different flavors. In the Philippines, you have Lampanog. So again, more interesting indigenous distilled spirits. Try to grab a bottle. Because once you get these bottles, it won't always be easy for you to get it again. So one thing you can do when you're making your cocktails, when you're working on balancing a new menu with something that's limited, is take this. I just kind of took this from the internet, by the way. Um, thank, thank you for that brand for being um, uh, But what you have here is just your basic recipe, right? You have uh, simple syrup, lemon juice, and a spirit. So try not, why not take the simple, switch it out with a palm sugar, or switch it out with a coconut palm sugar, or any of the other sweeteners that you might have encountered on your journey around the world. Don't overthink it. Just take a classic recipe and substitute things out. For juice, you can get really creative with other uh, citrus as well. Try pomelo juice instead of lemon. I do a pomelo um, paloma that's pretty fun. We have to adjust with acid actually, but pomelo paloma, paloma is really fun drink. And with your spirits, just if you don't have a whole lot, why not do an ounce and a half of a whiskey or an Angostura rum, uh, and then a half ounce of a rack or a little bit of baijiu, just to add complexity and depth to that drink and also allow you to stretch your ingredients. But whatever you do, oh, ooh, real quick, I'm going through some of these examples. So this is a really fun, uh, what's going on in Asia right now. So this is a bar called Native that just opened. It's an amazing bar. They're doing great things. So they're only using ingredients locally and only recipes that are regionally uh, available, like sort of traditional. This is Mango Lassi on the right. This is from one of the staff at 28 Hong Kong Street, which did a killer job for this competition. This is actually um, high nice chicken rice. So he made a cocktail that tasted like chicken rice. Again, using savory, but still having a refreshing drink. Really fantastic. It just nailed it out of the park. The finish was fan was amazing on the string. So I think he won that competition too. Uh, so this was really fun. So this was in Chengdu, China, just outside of Qingcheng Mountain where the panda reserves are. So this is with Baijiu. It's basically a Baijiu painkiller. Um, and we sourced all the stones from the mountain in the bamboo forest in the background. We went out and just cut them daily and got the bamboo shoots. The straws are actually bam young bamboo shoots. We just bored it out with a long drill, boiled it, dried it, and we let the guests take them home if they want. The Chinese have a really funny sense of humor, so uh, those are Angostura tapioca pearls on top, and they say it looks like panda poop, and they love it. So, yeah, if a panda pooped in the woods, there you go. And really the last thing I can say before jumping off the stage and passing it to these amazing panelists is don't stop traveling, and even if you can't get a chance to get out, sometimes life is hard, try to bring travel to you. Reach out to the communities, find those people who have brought their culture into small pockets throughout the rest of the world, and talk to them. Ask them, they have lots to share. And the best thing about that is you'll have lots to share with your guests. So I hope you have fun adventuring and trying new ingredients. Thank you. So before I bring up Micah, I just thought we should do a little wake up exercise. And isn't that cool? Put the cap on first. Oh wait, that's fine. And then let's all give it a We should all kick. scream so they can hear us next door. Shake out. Yeah! Woo! Woo! Loud noises! <laughs> okay, don't over, I don't, don't ever delight it. The other thing it, I yeah. didn't mention, in the little cup in front of you is the bird's nest water neat. If you feel so inclined to try something really outside the box. It just tastes bird's more nest. like a, kind of a barley water. It's pretty mild, but it has incredible health benefits. So um, this drink was inspired by uh, kind of a hangover cure. You know, we thought it would be Friday morning. We'll try and do a hangover cure. Adding bubbles, because that's kind of a fun, brunchy drink. Uh, it's basically just to twist on an old Cuban, but with some really unique, exotic ingredients and, um, and in a fun kind of packaging, fun serve. So here's Micah. Woo! Thank you. All right, so um, I guess a little bit of what I want to talk about is not only technique, but why, why technique? So um, I think the aviary as a whole kind of has this perception that everything we do is, is smoke and mirrors, and um, there's a lot of uh, show that goes into it, which is true to a certain extent, but only when it actually is affecting the experience positively. So um, we never want to shove technique down people's throats, uh, and you never want to let technique actually 
interfere with the experience. Um, and uh, I'll show you some examples of that. Uh, so I guess creativity, how we look at it is the first thing that we always do is, is try to solve a problem or ask a question. Um, so I guess the first example of this started at Alinea 2005 um, when the restaurant was opening. And the first question was, why do restaurants have tablecloths? Why do three Michelin star restaurants have tablecloths? And the answer is because every three Michelin star restaurant has a tablecloth, right? What's the why? What is the, what is the purpose of that? What is it actually doing for the experience? It's not doing anything except hiding a bad table. So just asking little, little questions like that. Why, why, does, why is something always done a specific way? Um, and sometimes there's not a good reason and there's, there's things that can be uh, improved upon, but you have to ask the question first and you have to be willing to um, kind of jump outside of the box, if you will. Uh, collaboration is a great way to be creative. So not everyone that's a bartender can make glassware. Not everyone that's a glass maker can bartend. So the, a really good way to do that is to collaborate with someone. Uh, it could be an artist, it could be you know, a producer, it could be a um, distillery, whatever it is. So find someone else who's an expert in a field that you're not an expert in and get them to kind of help uh, bring the process along. So technique can, can technique drive experience. So this is, like I said, you, you always want to have what we call a purposeful intent. So if you're doing things just to do it, then it turns into a gimmick. So if there's not a reason behind what you're doing, if there's not an, an actual end goal that you're aiming for, then, then what's the point of, of doing you know, some fancy technique or, or putting a powder in or putting citric acid unless there's an actual reason. Um, so make sure that it's actually driving the experience. Uh, creativity, you know, and, and this is very popular now, is just adding another element. So that could be an aroma, it could be a visual cue, it could be some, you know, like your logo on, on something, whatever it is. So just adding something else that's gonna make something memorable. So that's a big part of, of creativity as well. And then always being able to tell yourself, stop. Because there's, there's a certain point where you've gone too far. Um, there's also times when you're gonna fail. You have to fail in order to be successful and, and kind of innovative. So don't be afraid to fail and don't be afraid to let people tell you that you failed. So show people what you do, talk through your idea, and then if it didn't work, throw it away, try, try again, do whatever you have to do. So not everything's gonna work the first time. Um, so problem solving. So obviously a big part of the aviary is is just this in, entire thing. So we sat down when we first opened and we kind of just went through a, a list of, of questions. So why, did, why does a Collins go in a Collins glass? Why does a cocktail go in a coupe? Um, and there's a lot of those are for good reasons because it, it's a Collins glass, it's a hurricane glass. Uh, and so those, the, you don't necessarily have to change things. So like I said, restraint is, is good sometimes. Um, but beyond that, like, you know, Make sure that it's, there's, a, there's a reason for it, that you're actually doing it with intent. Um, and is there a better way? So is there an, another thing that you can do? Is there something, a part of that that you can change that can actually make something better? Um, this is a, a really good idea uh, and a really good demonstration of that. So number one thing that I absolutely hate in cocktails is crushed ice. Uh, <laughs> So I actually love crushed ice. And I love <laughs> <laughs> you didn't tell me that before. But sorry. No, it's sorry, okay. Micah. Uh, and actually, the reason that I hate it is because everyone thinks that uh, your drink isn't cold enough unless you have three inches of ice on top of the glass, um, which I totally disagree with, but that's another story. Um, but it just runs everywhere, and everyone puts so much ice in it because they don't want it to dilute. Then why not put something else in it besides just water crushed ice? So this is flavored crushed ice. Like, very kind of obvious to a certain extent, but not obvious at all. So we had uh, a designer design a mold for us that would resemble the size of, of crushed ice. The good thing about this is it's super, super consistent. So every drink that we make is the exact same size and is gonna dilute the exact same. Um, and then when it dilutes, it doesn't actually dilute. So you don't have to put an overflowing glass full of crushed ice and, and have a drink all over the table. So. Um, so it's a good example, I think. Uh, and then again, so this is a, a larger form of crushed ice. So sometimes the, the flavor is, is too intense. So we tried it and it, the flavor is a little too intense. So we actually had a larger mold developed so that we could have large crushed, crushed ice basically. So um, we wanted to, you know, 
have, a, have an option that was not as quick diluting. So again, that's looking at something and then being able to, to fail a little bit and then kind of correct based on what the guest actually is enjoying about the drink. Um, in the rocks. So um, this is a, a very, very simple technique um, that I, I'm 99.9% .9 sure that we pioneered. So um, it's, a, it's a cocktail on, on the rocks, basically. Um, but here's our, here's our extra element. So we walk this out, the cocktail's inside the ice cube, you get a slingshot, you crack it open, you're never gonna forget it. Um, and then at the end of the day, you have an old fashioned on the rocks. It's, it, it, it's simple and the end result is something that is impacted in a positive way, the experience, it's super memorable. And then at the end of the day, it's a, it's a really good cocktail. So that's, I think, you know, a, a good example of a win. Um, so, Again, just the, the flavored ice, and speaking of chicken stock, um, so, so we always look at it and I always tell people like, why would, you, why would you start a soup with water? So it's the same idea for us in starting a cocktail with, with water ice, which in some cases is great, you know, like you can have a nice sexy piece of clear ice and it's all good, right? Um, but there's also instances where that's not the best, the best thing for the cocktail. So. Um, it's, it's cool sometimes to do flavored, flavored ice, um, and we'll give some examples of that too. Uh, and then just in general, you have the idea of, of when you serve a drink on flavored ice, you have an initial drink that tastes like the, the drink that you poured on top of it, then you have a drink that's part drink, part ice, and then you have a drink that's mostly ice. So you kind of get this added value of, of multi um, elements of drinks that kind of all taste different. Let's you charge three dollars more each. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, a little more problem solving. So the ice cube on the left is a traditional uh, shard for a, a long drink. Um, the problem with that is you either have to A, put a straw in it, um, which is not bad, or B, drink it out of the glass and then get hit in the, in the nose with ice. So we solved this by literally just thinking about how we could get an ice cube that wouldn't fall out of the glass. So we looked all over for glassware um, and we couldn't find it. So we found a glass maker that would make us a glass. Um, so a, a company called Rona, which is based in Czechoslovakia, had a, a glass blower that blew us a glass that's actually more narrow on the top of the glass than it is on the bottom of the glass. So the ice cube can literally never fall out. Uh, and then you just put a long drink on it. So you have, you have what was originally for us as a problem which is uh, you know, ice hitting you in the face, and now it literally can never happen. So you've, you've positively impacted the, the drink, the presentation looks great, and um, it's, it's, at the end of the day, it's, just, it's good for the guest. So here's a couple more examples of that. Um, there's a, a taller version of the glass as well, and then two, two short versions. Um, so here's a, a good example, and I'll show you the end result of this, but this is a really good drink. It was a riff on a 20th century. So we poured a riff on a 20th century over an ice cube that was it's basically watermelon and barbecue and mezcal. The thing about those three things is they're really delicious. Uh, and people actually were, were kind of upset with us because the, the ice cube wasn't melting fast enough. Um, and it's, it's an awkward shape. It was weird to kind of pull out of the glass and, and eat. So um, we actually listened to them. And although originally we thought this was the best way to serve it, we got the feedback and then we corrected it. We weren't, we weren't too good for, for our guests and, and the people that were actually receiving the drink. So being aware is, is great. Um, so again, collaboration. So a couple of different ideas of things that you can collaborate on. Um, find somebody that makes glassware. You know, like that's for, for nowadays, like one of the most important things is, is everyone sees the same glasses over and over and over again. So literally just getting uh, it doesn't have to be expensive either, that's the best part. Um, but if you have your own glassware, it's, it kind of becomes a symbol of your brand. Um, tools, so we have you know, ice molds and things like that that we have designers make that are actually cheaper than like, buying them on Amazon, um, which is really cool. And then you know, spirits, music, there's a, there's a lot of ways you can collaborate, but just be open to the fact that you're not, you're not an expert at everything. Uh, so here's a couple more examples of, of our collaboration. So these are um, molds. They're, they're meant to be the same size as cold draft. So we could make 
essentially what was cold draft, but then flavor it. So you'd have the exact same shape as a cold draft cube, the same size, and then you could, you could use it as a flavor instead of as water. These are the, sm the larger version of the crushed ice in the mold. So um, this is raspberry ice at the time, but cool little photo. Uh, another red uh, liqueur. Uh, this is super cool. So um, also another thing that we talk about a lot is uh, it's like silent hospitality. So there's a lot of ways that you can impact someone's experience. And there's a lot of times when you don't actually want to tell them that you're doing that. Uh, a really good example of this, when we first opened, we had a server that took a coat for a coat check. And the button was loose on the coat, and it was literally about to fall off. So he ran downstairs, sewed the button back on, put it on the hanger. Uh, and the guests literally never noticed until they walked out. And then they walked out, and they buttoned their button. And they probably, I can only imagine, because we never talked to them about it, they probably looked down and were like, what happened to my button? Because I'm sure they knew it was loose, right? And that was the last thing that they experienced of the aviary was they had no idea what happened. We never told them we did it. We never confirmed that we did it. But I'm sure at the end of the day, they probably realized that someone had sewed their button. Um, so this is a good example of that. So we like to gamble a lot. So we play blackjack as a company a lot. We go out. That's one of our things. Um, so we wanted to make a drink that had the sound of people stacking poker chips. Uh, at, a, at a gambling table, but it's not the best thing to tell everyone that this drink was inspired by your gambling problem. Uh, so, <laughs> so uh, yeah, we don't, there's a lot of people that we don't really tell, so we use subtle hints to kind of get the point across, but without shoving it down their throat. Um, so we got with the, the same design company and asked them to make a mold that resembled a poker chip, so it's the, roughly the same size, and then we freeze it with a small amount of alcohol, uh, this is cinnamon and Angostura bitters. So that will give the sound of a poker chip. So you have to like dilute it a little bit to get more of a hollow sound so that that sound happens. Um, the, the name of the drink is actually called Up the Ice Andy. So that's one of the small cues. Uh, the reason for that being is that it's the most amount of flavors of ice in a single cocktail that we've ever sold. So it's kind of just this building of a single concept that then at the end of the day is it's a really solid drink. And then if people catch on to these little small cues, um, it's, it's memorable, but not something that you have to tell every single guest. How many types of ice, Micah? Oh, so that one, uh, there's um, allspice, black cardamom, cinnamon, cinnamon and Angostura, white peach, white peach and Angostura, uh, nutmeg, mace, <laughs> Uh, and cayenne pepper. It's, uh, ice. it's all ten ice. Ices. All yeah. ice. Different types of ice. They <laughs> all hate me. <laughs> I always, I always tell them like when we first opened, I was the only one that did the ice, so I did literally everything. And there's five of them now, so I don't feel that bad. Uh, yeah, we're at 39 different types of ice on our menu right now, so it's it's getting a little out of control. Um, it's another seminar, I think. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, the, the, the poker chips. So this is something pretty new for us. That's, that's super cool. Uh, here's the drink that I talked about. So the 20th, 20th century riff. Um, being playful is, is cool and, and kind of like not being too serious. And the aviary is a place that's, you know, it's very serious. So people come in and they think that they're going to drink something wrong or eat something wrong. We're going to yell at them. We're going to throw them out. Uh, you know, it's, it's fairly expensive. So it has this kind of air of of you know it can be it can be a little intimidating so the best way to get through the intimidation is to do things that are playful and fun and kind of tongue-in-cheek in a way so um, popsicles are, are a good example of that um, so using ice as a tool so we freeze a disc for a cocktail um, and the, the the ice actually then becomes a tool so we cap the smoke so we smoke the glass with allspice and then put this pineapple disc on top of that that captures the smoke um, the aviary has the unique challenge that there is not a bar so um, we want to take as much of the bar and the the action of making the drink out to the table as we can um, so this is a, a good way to do that so 
you smoke the glass in the kitchen and you pour the drink over and then you tell them it's got smoke in it and they're like, yeah, I could taste it, I guess, if you told me. Um, but if you cap it and then you keep the cocktail separate and then you walk it to the table, pour it at the table, they see the whole process and then they can smell the smoke. They're, they're more involved in the process. Um, it's, a, it's more memorable, memorable then. Uh, so again, can, can technique drive experience? So making sure that you're always doing things with intent and you're not doing things just to do things. Um, thank you. <laughs> That's two minutes, actually. Cool. I couldn't find a segue. Uh, so time is an ingredient. Uh, the, the porthole is a good example of this. So if you, made, if you made this cocktail back in the kitchen, it would be one drink, it would be in a coupe, it would not be that interesting. Um, but if you just put everything inside of a teapot for, you know, like exactly what this is, then you have 25 different cocktails. You can taste it as it infuses. You see the process. It's beautiful. Um, it's good. This is uh, my riff on a Dave Arnold technique, which is nitro muddling. So uh, the problem there being is that you have to strain it after you do it. Um, so we came up with a puree basically that we froze into the the glass so that way when you muddled it it would completely dissolve so adding another dimension so here's a couple of those ideas a really good way that you can add these dimensions as well is interactivity so um, keeping in ingredients separate and letting the guests kind of add their own touch to it so uh, it's a Moscow mule ginger beer a bunch of garnishes and then on the side is the vodka. So you pour the vodka over, use the lemongrass as a swizzle stick, or the guest does. Um, again, they're not gonna forget that. So a bunch of photos of just ways that we take the, the process out to the, the room. So I think dry ice is kind of getting overdone to a certain extent, but still if you use it in the right way, it's super impactful. Um, and then there's the allspice smoke. This is another dry ice uh, tea drink, but we wanted to um, make sure the guests could smell the tea brewing because it was one of the coolest smells, um, a specific tea. And then we kind of have this thing where you want to really amp up the, the presentation and the, the experience to make the story whole. So this is a tiki inspired drink. So you have the, the cannon blast into the drink over the, the flame and then you have a, a ship in a bottle and we serve uh, Moroccan spices. Um, funky rum from Java. Uh, so you have this kind of holistic story. Again, bringing the aroma of tea brewing out to the table. Um, this is super kind of tongue in cheek, but fun. So um, not everything has to be expensive. So these are like $1.35 on Etsy. Uh, if there was a rewards program for Etsy, I would be the number one uh, Etsy -er <laughs> in the world. All of the stuff for the office is completely bought from Etsy. Um, but this is super simple. Cracker Jack flavored drink and then a temporary tattoo. Trends, so follow trends. Make sure you're following trends and being smart, but do it your own way. So branding obviously is huge. Branding an orange, branding whatever it is. But we brand a coaster that's made out of uh, Douglas fir and then we actually smoke the glass with it. So it, it, it then turns into something that's actually adding to the cocktail as opposed to just being for show. Uh, here's a couple of failures. Um, or not yet complete, so I'll say. We're trying to light the end of this ice on fire, so if anyone has any ideas, I'll give you my card. Uh, <laughs> it looks like a match, it's pink pepper, that falls out, and then uh, we just gotta figure out how to light water on fire. Um, no big deal. Pretty easy, right? Uh, <laughs> next is the pickleback. I always say this, because someone's gonna have a really good idea, but I wanna pour a shot of whiskey in a glass, and then someone would be like, well, where's the pickle juice? And then you're like, oh, it's the shot glass. But you can't, you can't know that it's edible. They ha the question has to be asked, otherwise it's ruined. So it has to not look like it's edible, and it has to be completely edible. Brand new technique, uh, sorry for the brand. Um, this is pyrolyzing, so we're taking and applying uh, how you make black garlic to spirits. So we're literally cooking spirits at 145. It's not exactly legal, we're trying to figure it out, but... Um, <laughs> It's unopened, so we, we think it's actually fairly legal because we're, we're, the, all we're doing is improperly storing it on purpose. Uh, <laughs> so that's gonna be my reason when they come to arrest me. Um, but yeah, it's cool. So it, it caramelizes the flavor, it changes the, the density, it changes the color, it does a lot of things. Um, but it's cool. All right, so a quick review. 
So make sure you ask questions. Not everything is, is perfect. Um, and you know, we've been making drinks for a while. There's, there's drinks that we will make that 100 years from now they will be making based on what we do. So, so try to innovate and try to make sure that we're, we're pushing the boundaries. Function, make sure that it's functional. Um, collaborate if you can't find someone or if you can't find something that you're looking for, find someone that can make it for you. Um, and then using old things or techniques and re repurposing them. So uh, beyond that, like we talked about a little bit, just be inspired, you know, go to bars, travel, come to tales, go to seminars, read, experience, because that's the number one way you're going to be inspired. Um, and, and thank you so much for having us. Cheers. Found such a cute. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm starting to feel really good from this Niger a cocktail, and we forgot to mention this: the chicken essence is not only a cure-all for everything, but it actually positively um, affects your neurotransmitters in your brain. So hopefully, you're feeling more focused after this cocktail. And we're going to move on to there. You go, vegans. Drinks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take it away, Elliot. First off, thank you so much for that picture of me. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, so, uh, my name's uh, Elliot. Uh, me and two other guys called Andy Mill and Ollie Brady found a company called Cocktail Training Co. A few years ago, it's gone fairly well. Uh, but our main thing is right from the start, we decided to do things in quite a sort of conceptual way. So, as, as Michael said, you know, sometimes there's just like innovation almost for no reason, and then sometimes it's, why don't I do it differently? Uh, and right from the start, we just thought, like, there, there are so many opportunities to just do things in quite a sort of an additional way, sort of a bit of extra entertainment. Um, and the thing about that is that if I was going to reduce this all down to just one word, it would probably be unity, because you can have all these great things. You can have a great drink, great festival, great name, great serve, great technique. Um, but if it doesn't unite in some way, it's not really a concept. So, like, for example, that one, uh, the Sauvignon Private Ryan, which <laughs> literally woke me up laughing. Uh, had that, which is quite a surreal experience, by the way, uh, waking up on your own laughing. <laughs> A few hours. Uh, but, uh, it took me a couple of hours to realise that I'd been having a dream about wine and World War II. <laughs> uh, but like that, that drink served in, you know, this, uh, this ration tin. Uh, it's got a label on it. It's garnished with like these matches, which when burnt had a really cool aroma to the room. It's got dog tag on it. Uh, and then the, the ingredients themselves are quite Normandy inspired. It's Calvados, local pomo, um, local wine. And you know, those things individually, like it was a very tasty drink. And one of our main things is that individually they have to work. Like if you were to just shake that drink and put it in a glass, it's got to taste absolutely great before you go putting it into something clever. Uh, but it, so individually, those things were good, but the, the whole was much more than the sum of the parts. And to me, that's what the concept is about. And that's very much what CDC is about. Uh, you know, when we started it, it was three 25-year-old guys with basically no money uh, and a limited amount of experience. And see how youthful I was there. I'm <laughs> going <laughs> stare here by now by comparison. Uh, but you know, the whole thing was that we, we didn't really have a lot of money to, to play with, so things had to be cheap and they had to be super, super fast. First venue was a sublease, which was still notoriously expensive in Oxford Circus, uh, so had to be like really volume driven. So usually when you see presentations like the stuff we do, you think you're going to be sat waiting for 15 minutes in a very serious environment. That was never the case with us. Like that Sauvignon Private Ryan was a four bottle pour with a lot of work in back of house to make sure that was still consistent and reliable, uh, and obviously a lot of training to make sure that all our staff could execute it well. Uh, but that drink I could genuinely knock out in 15 seconds, and that was all about back of house. Um, and then uh, I guess the other thing to cover is like operations versus starting point. So for us, like we, we approach drinks just a little bit differently because we actually start with the concept. Like sometimes you can take inspiration from an ingredient, but with us we usually start with the idea. Uh, sometimes we'll have these brainstorming sessions. Sometimes it's just, hey, wouldn't it be funny if this, like I think Andy came down once and said, why don't we do a twist on a woo-woo in an owl and call it a twit to woo-woo? So we did. <laughs> That's, that's literally it, like, we just decided to do that on our first menu. And then it became a matter of operationalizing it. You can't get owl mugs from everywhere. We had to buy them from BHS, and then that company went under halfway through the menu. Uh, and you have to just find ways of, like, rolling with it. But, you know, as an industry, we've accepted so many things as, like, just common wisdom. You know, if you take the GP, for example, like, gross profit margin, that's not actually very relevant to a lot of profit. Um, but as an industry, we just take it. We take things like stock counts and so, so many other things. And, you know, I think some tech firm at the moment is trying to coin the hashtag today's impossible is tomorrow's normal. 
probably Samsung, I don't know. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, with, with that, like we we did just you know find ways of operationalizing things. You know, so we have got ordering lists for all these little things. We have got things like dildos on the stock sheets, which have to be counted. That's a story from another time. <laughs> um, uh, I thought you were going to do the. Dildos. I'm not going to do the whole story. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that's actually frozen dildos. <laughs> they were. They had to be frozen. Sounds like a, a big specific heat capacity. Can't let that off. Purposeful intent. Purposeful. <laughs> <laughs> dildos. Okay. Um, but yeah, I so, slow down because oh, people might not understand your accent. That's true. I did talk fast and fast. Yeah, that's the one. Cool. But anyway, that's that's kind of just the theoretical part of this. So well, all I'm going to do now is I'm going to discuss some of the things we've done, which were just a bit of fun, really. So this was the first like concept that we did. Um, it was really just to annoy a friend of mine. Um, so this, uh, this lady called Amanda took over Jim Beam as a brand just about the time it got purchased by Suntory. And you know, for everyone in this room, like you know, fairly included in the industry, we know Jim Beam are big and Suntory are giant. But to, to the average person, that was just a bit of a weird thing because like a lot of people hadn't heard of Suntory, and then they got bought. You know, what they they bought Jim Beam. Uh, and this, uh, this lady put up an online portal for a cocktail competition and I put this in saying, oh, this isn't for the competition, this is just to advertise my consultancy services for how to reach your new market. And it was obviously just meant to piss her off. And it did. Um, and she, she got back at me by putting me through to the world final, uh, which was a great company. A little closer to the mic, too. A little closer to the mic, gotcha. Um, uh, so the drink itself was really, really simple. Um, it was a matcha-infused bourbon, it was a ginger infusion, Yuzu, uh, a premix of, I think it was tamarind, coriander, uh, ume wine, and a couple of other things. Uh, it was a double bottle pour on your left and a cross pour on your right, which is quite technical, but again, with enough training, it just becomes really, really quick. It was churned over crushed ice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Crushed. Crushed ice cream. Um, uh, and then it was topped off with these noodles, uh, which we made ourselves, which is very tasty. Uh, it was quite a sweet drink because it was meant to go out to like a high volume audience. It's just meant to be approachable to most people. And then it was garnished with these chopstick straws. And the whole thing was that it was just really, really quick and everyone just loved the presentation. So that was a token CDC drink for us when we first started because it just it pleased everyone. It looked super cool. It was profitable. It was quick. That's kind of all we needed it to be. And that was the welcome to Kentucky. Have a nice day. We got it translated on Google Translate um, to the, I think actually I've, I've got a couple of example menus from, a, from an on-tour thing. Uh, they, they were actually from a Bacardi event, so imagine that's Angostura, it would taste delicious. Um, I can imagine Bacardi is exactly what you guys want to read after last night, so yeah, sorry about that. Uh, but yeah, the, um, yeah that's, uh, you, can, you can see from the menus kind of how it was presented in the menu. Um, this was one of the first ones we photographed. You can tell it's a very high quality photo. It was actually done on my camera phone in my business partner's living room. It was before we had a bar. Uh, those are chipsticks, so very easy to source. Uh, we had it on London Cocktail Week and I think we emptied out pretty much all stores of chipsticks over the course of the week within a, like a four mile radius, which got to be quite difficult. Um, the drink is in the ketchup bottle. Uh, it was kind of bourbon, like a peach and chili jam. Again, a little bit of ginger, uh, a few other bits and pieces just to kind of like round it out, give it complexity. Uh, and the main point of this one is for my second menu is we always have something on the menu which when you bring it to the table, their reaction is, what the hell is this? Uh, like, I hate it when people say, oh, that's so creative. No, I want fear. Like, I want actual <laughs> fear. <laughs> and that's exactly what I got, and that was called the Snapper's Delight. Uh, this was probably my favorite thing to buy ever. Uh, so these are ceramic wellies, which they sold from uh, Poundland in Holloway. Poundland is a, a UK chain of shops where everything predictably costs a pound. Yeah, we have dollar stores, same thing. Yeah, there you go. Cool. <laughs> um, so I was just walking along in Poundland and I saw a small ceramic wellie and I decided I wanted it. Or I wanted 2,000 of them. Um, uh, uh, you know, the guy was a bit confused when I asked for 2,000 ceramic wellies, as you would be. Uh, the Uber driver was also confused. My housemates <laughs> were confused. Business partners, investors, everyone was really confused. Um, customers, quite confused. Twitter, very confused. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I was trying to ride like the kind of the whole festival wave thing. So you know, British youth festivals, uh, Glastonbury, that kind of thing. Uh, I don't know if who here remembers the whole thing with Kate Moss and her wellies. They were like signed off. It was really like iconic thing for the British young rock scene. Uh, and the drink itself like, is a great example of where the ingredients actually weren't that important. Uh, it was cranberry juice, lemon juice, peach, mint, chinzano, and lychee liqueur. So it's not exactly a craft cocktail. It was tasty. It was a well-balanced drink. 
But if you look at that and decide to put an old fashioned in it, you're an idiot. Uh, <laughs> like, no, one, no one wants that. Uh, it was just meant to be a fruity, easy drink in the sort of vessel ordered by the sort of person who clearly wants a fruity, easy drink. So that was, that was the hashtag Festival Chic, and it still got the greatest social media exposure just because that was the official hashtag for Glastonbury that year, which was, I'd call it genius if it was deliberate. Um, but so you wrote, you <laughs> that, yeah. that, is, that is meant to produce a certain amount of disgust in all of you, don't worry. Uh, so this was, um, on our previous menu, we had a lot of like uh, drinks which kind of were meant to inspire emotions. Um, and I wanted full on disgust. Uh, the, the illustration for it is pretty creepy. Um, and then the drink itself is actually just incredibly pleasant. Like it's not a challenging drink by any means. It was Pisco, a pear liqueur, cardamom, vanilla infusion, um, a couple of different kinds of acidity, and then Prosecco. Most things were batched, stirred, and then topped with Prosecco. Uh, and then those dentures, so the whole grandma's and Nash's imagery, uh, are actually made of white chocolate. They are upsettingly based on my teeth. Uh, I had to get <laughs> before the hockey accent. Um, I had to get uh, moulds made up, and then the teeth themselves are actually white chocolate, and we leave them in the freezer afterwards, so uh, it doesn't actually compromise the quality of the drink at all. Uh, you've got these essentially white chocolate ice cubes, which not only maintain the chill, they don't add to the dilution, uh, and actually maintain the carbonation from Prosecco as well. Uh, and then at the end of it, they have the hilarity of realising that they can eat those dentures, and there's nothing more surreal than watching people eat teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Really, really enjoyed that. Uh, but the main thing, of course, is that the name of the cocktail is the aperitif. <laughs> so, uh, this, uh, these next ones are from the current menu. Um, one, one of the things we love doing at CDC is kind of taking the piss out of bartenders. Because uh, we're, we're a great bunch, but we can be hilariously guarding of certain things. And uh, at some point, it's just become perfectly accepted that uh, you know, we are making drinks for customers and not for ourselves which is, is good, it's much less obnoxious that way. Uh, and uh, one of the areas in which we just refuse to accept that is kind of in classics. Like if someone comes along and asks for a Negroni with something a bit different, a lot of people are kind of a bit arsy about it. And so every drink on this new menu, I've got a couple of copies with me, um, are inspired by classics of sort of various levels of obscurity. Uh, so this is the Blue Moon, which is sort of at its essence, essentially gin, citrus, and violette, uh, except we completely changed it for fun, just to annoy bartenders. Uh, so it's uh, shiitake infused Geneva, um, it's got some citrus, got some violettes, but it's also got like uh, celery and basil sherbet. It's really tasty. Uh, and the, the imagery is inspired by an acid trip which one of my business partners had in which he thought that the uh, moon had grown a face and was trying to blow away the surface of the earth with him on it, which is really, really scary. Uh, <laughs> so like we wanted to play off that. That's uh, like a, a cloud on top, it's just candy floss, it's really easy to make. but. I don't make it anymore because I've got a beard and I don't know if anyone here with a beard has ever made candy floss but your face is sticky for the rest of your life. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, it, that was also kind of riffing off like how intimidating certain things can be for customers. So, you know, they're ordering this kind of cool sounding drink and then a hot air balloon turns up. Sure. <laughs> um, this was playing off our East London heritage. This is a riff on the scoff law. I'm sure you guys know Prohibition Classic. By consuming during Prohibition, you were scoffing the law. Um, it's like the ingredients haven't actually got that much in common, the classic scoffle. Uh, but the you know the blood red colour of it is meant to be literally reminding you of blood. Uh, contains chemicals which kind of summon this almost stringency in your palate, which is a little bit bloody, a little bit like you've taken one on the chin. Um, the <laughs> sorry, that was <laughs> I found that a lot funnier than everyone else in the room. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't, wasn't a joke. Take your one on the um, chin. <laughs> Uh, you've got your image of uh, the Crays, the notorious East London gangsters, or I think Cray Cray as it's called here. Um, uh, but then you've also got like this, this magnifying glass, which is a bit of fun to sort of look through as you're drinking it. We're aware that some of these things have been done by other people, like current menu we've got a cocktail served literally in an egg. We, we know that's been done, but no one's really done it in service. Um, and particularly like our drinks aren't expensive, they're not you know, slow or sort of indulgent. So uh, the idea is that we just, we just do them and it's not especially pretentious. Um, you've got your magnifying glass, which is kind of a, a classic piece of imagery for like British, I guess, like spy game or um, detective work. Uh, and then that's been aromatized with like a rain aroma, and it smells literally exactly like freshly fallen rain. It's really, really weird. Uh, but the idea is that when you are like leaning over it, drinking it, you're, you've got all these pieces of imagery of like East London crime kind of being united in one. And then uh, finally, this is actually the Angostura serve we have on the menu. 
So one of the things I love about Angostura Amaro is that uh, it, it basically makes things like Trinidad Sours actually affordable from our perspective. Uh, and this is probably the best-selling drink of the menu. It is a, a Trinidad Sour slushy uh, topped off with ginger ale, so that when you stir in the ginger ale yourself as a customer, then the whole thing just dissolves. Uh, so it means you don't have to leave the seashells in the freezer, which is not a set of words I expected to say when I woke up today. Uh, and yet, like, the drink just stays cold and just generally very nice. Uh, but the drink itself was a joke about consumerism, because we were appalled when we found out how much the seashells were. Because everyone looks at a seashell and just assumes, that's a seashell, that's free, I'm going to go to the beach and get me a seashell. Uh, seashells are not food safe, so we had to get them fabricated for £45, which is probably about 60 bucks. Uh, so, piece. yeah, each more more than the average martini glass. Uh, so the, the joke <laughs> is that you know, you've got this thing which everyone would think of as being free, but it's actually really, really expensive for us. We've actually got a note at the front of the menu saying, "Please don't steal the seashells." <laughs> Should be printed onto three and a half thousand menus. Um, but yeah, that, that's pretty much it for me. To be honest, I just wanted to have some examples of some of the fun things we do. Anyone wants to talk more about it afterwards? Just give me a shout. But I'm going to hand back to some. Elliot. I'm leaving a good amount of time at the end for questions. Uh, we've got one more speaker, and Dan's going to come up and wake everybody up. <laughs> yeah. I feel like an animator in, a, in an old folk's home. <laughs> uh, right. Fine. I'll leave that there. Take this away. Walk with me. Shuffle around the front. Come over to somewhere else. I'm louder than the microphone, if anyone's noticed, so I might not actually use one. Um, hey guys, how are you doing? <laughs> right, my name is Dan, I am uh, here to talk to you today about everything and nothing. Um, I'm also going to pace around. My hands are really cold and my nipples are really erect because it's very cold. <laughs> so, that, was, that was inside voice, I should have been, I'm not so sure. <laughs> anyway, so now that I'm doing this, it's a Louis C.K. stand-up, ooh, there's a clicker. Thank you. Right, so, um, hi, welcome. Um, every single one of these individuals is fantastic, and what they've talked about is something about the bar or the experience. Um, I'm actually gonna talk about everything and nothing, and the reason for that is, is that I'm sure in the description you saw that it was avant-garde cocktails. I'm sure those of you who don't speak French would then maybe Googled avant-garde and then maybe looked into, no one did, did they? There was a, a little laugh in the room. So that's me shouting. Obviously, as you can tell, I don't need a microphone. So obviously, giving me a megaphone was a really smart idea. Um, <laughs> let's move on. All right, so let's get fancy. Um, this is, I don't have a lot of slides because I don't own a bar. I'm actually homeless, and I've been homeless for 11 months. So if anyone has, do you have a hat and just pass around? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, if you Google avant-garde, of course you'll end up on Wikipedia, like anyone else who's presenting uh, this year, week. And avant-garde itself as a term is very interesting, because it's an art movement, essentially, that formed over 100 years ago. And it comes from the French word avant-garde, it means vanguard, so all sort of on the frontier of anything, essentially. Um, so, what I did was I just found some images. Those of you into art, of course, you've seen Salvador Dali there on the bottom left. You've got Van Gogh, um, the nice part with the ear. He couldn't do the other side. It was awkward to paint. You've got Cubism, Surrealism, Primitivism. And then that's a picture of a donkey or something. And I think, it, I can't remember the ism itself, but it looks like bestiality. Um, that was a sex joke. Anyway, <laughs> so... That's the thing, you know, we're visual, <laughs> visual people. That's why if you see some of the photography from the guys, visually, that's the first thing you see. We, are, we do talk a lot about the different senses. And it's very interesting because the question I wanted to ask about avant-garde, it is on the frontier of sort of thought, right? You're on the frontier. So there is no right or wrong in avant-garde. The question is, why the hell are we paying $65 for a seminar where there is no right or wrong? question. So I'm going to try and answer that. What we've seen is finished examples. And I want to talk about sort of the creative process. Because every single one of these movements inspired another part of these movements. 
what they did was they, in many ways, did what Micah does, which is they asked the questions why and whatever. They created themselves a box out of which they had to climb out of. They created themselves a problem which they had to solve. Some of them haven't been solved yet. That's the matchsticks. The ma matchsticks, that's the word. I don't speak English very well. I'm from Russia. Um, uh, we helped you this year with your elections. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> alternative facts. Anyway, I don't know, that, that just kind of went somewhere. Um, so my whole point is, we box ourselves in, we try and come out of the box. Because when we're forced with a problem, we have to find a solution. Because a lot of people say, oh, carte blanche, do what you like. And you're like, what the hell is going on? Um, so that's what I find with the avant-garde movements. It has transcended into music, into film. Some of it is really weird. I don't have, I don't, it's not safe for work or for children on the internet to record, so I didn't put any videos on there. They were weird. But what I have come up with is sort of a theory. A theory which would hopefully explain the thought process behind all three of these individuals. A theory that's quite easygoing and explainable that you may be able to take this away at home. And whether you are short for cash, whether you have an expensive, massive investor who makes ceramics for you and there's dildos and chicken essence and uh, all that jazz. You can do it at home. Um, so, um, I have a theory. And the theory is based on something that we've all encountered in our lives. And it's based on the Rubik's Cube. Has anyone seen one of these before? There's the children's toy that you all fail to solve. Yes. Oh, you've seen it? Oh, okay. You yeah, out. I thought everybody, if you said who hasn't seen one, then nobody would raise their hands. Okay, who hasn't seen one? Okay, now that's better. Go okay. ahead. Carry on. All right. <laughs> um, so, I'm sure you've all seen this. I don't know how many of you have actually solved this. If you're Asian, you could probably do it in five seconds. Haha. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly prejudiced racist jokes. Um, <laughs> I need to turn this around a bit because it's interactive. So, what I want to talk about is, we all know what a Rubik's Cube is. It's got six sides, and I like to apply, as part of the creative thinking process for the avant-garde sort of movement, um, that every side is a, an important aspect of creating a cocktail. So I like to throw things at people, so what I'm going to do now is throw this at you, and then you have a chance to also be loud, and I want you to tell me, in your opinion, because everyone here is either an enthusiast, or a bartender, or something along those lines, or you're a drinker, and in my opinion, you know, we're not actually, we're not actually drunks, because, uh, well, sorry, we're not actually alcoholics, we're drunks, because alcoholics go to meetings, and drunks go to bars, so it's better. <laughs> so, um, anyone here is asleep? No one? Right, catch. Good catch. Right, you've, you've caught it. I want you to tell me yes. one aspect of a cocktail. What is the first thing that comes into your mind when you're creating a drink? Anything. You've got a drink in front of you. Story. Story. Cool. Throw it at someone else. Please catch. Oh. Oh. <laughs> We're throwing something around. Please. please you all signed the liability catch. waiver, right? Right. Hey, it didn't break. All right. Uh, yeah, that was please, uh, please catch it. I need it for later. Um, so, we've got story. What else do we have? Check in my notes of story. It's on there. Um, it's on there. Experience. Experience, but, um, but when you're making a drink, you know, the experience, okay, ritual, ritual, that's what I wrote, you know? So, I'm going to stick to my script. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put this somewhere else. Experience, ritual, great, good job, well done. Uh, story, story, that's part of name now. Just saying, well, well done before that. Uh, anyone else? How taste. How taste, taste, and what, what does taste break down to? Flavor, flavor, cool, cool, cool. Uh, uh, ingredients, well done. He's, he's, <laughs> He's learning English. <laughs> Ingredients that affect all of those things. Throw it at someone again. Gently. Yeah. Go long. Go long. <laughs> no one's even putting their hands up. Oh, that's good. Hey! $65 to throw a piece of plastic. <laughs> right. Avant garde is fuck. Um, so, what, what do you think? Um, 
You've got you've got ingredients slash taste taste um, aroma flavor. We've got name. We've got the ritual of how it's served. You know, if I pour you a glass with a clear liquid and give you a lime on the end, there's salt. You're gonna assume it's tequila. You know. But you're making a drink. Okay. Yeah. You know what? You're smart. You're like way ahead of the curve. You're thinking about reproducing. That's that's you should hire. That's. that's <laughs> Replication. Think about, you, you've got a drink in your hand, like, you know, what is it? We've got, the ingredients are in there, and then you know the name, it's just a glassware, perfect, woohoo! And it's on my list too. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, okay, I can get it back now, to be honest. I actually had aroma and garnish on there, but I think, you know, you kind of covered that all as one. So, um, can somebody just pass the Rubik's Cube back to me? <laughs> I'm really, I'm really throw it, no, throw it. No, no, <laughs> Definitely uh, miss. So, six sides, six sides. If we're going to call this, uh, you know, we've got surrealism, we've got uh, all those isms. This is Rubikism, because um, I'm original like that. So, six sides, six fundamental elements to the drink. So, in theory, if we chicken essence it, if we get the ingredients right, perfect. If we Think of the glassware, of the concept, the technique behind it, fantastic. More sides sold. If we think of the sort of, the, the, the way it's served, the conceptuality essentially of it, we have, in theory, a perfect drink. So the question is, what next? Me, Mika touched, Mika, <laughs> European, uh, Mika touched on it. Um, and the question is like, so this is my drink. Let's just imagine, this is the drink we've all created together according to my script. And now, that's a coaster. That Rubik's Cube is a coaster. Now, it's a hat. It's beautiful. And now, Jesus. that's a blunt force trauma. Um, the idea behind everything that we do is purpose. Come on, come on, go, go, go. <laughs> My father never loved me. <laughs> so the idea is purpose. The purpose of what we're trying to create. Whether it is something we're fixing with a technique, you know, the purpose that kind of fuels, is fueled by the technique that we use to approach it. Whether the purpose is uh, fueled by the, the ingredients, the, driven by the ingredients that we find in the location that we go with, whether it's driven by the conceptuality and sort of construction, uh, constrictions of the venue that we're at. If we look into every side of that drink and then we find the purpose of what we want that drink to do, that is what drives every single one of these people's cocktails that we saw today. Everything is about purpose. And that's why Micah said, why? You know, he asked himself why, and he found why he was doing it. It gave him purpose, and then he found the drink on the road to that purpose. Um, please, later on, help me find the pieces, because I think the cats would get a bit upset. Um, yeah. Um, and so that leads me on to sort of my final slide, um, which is a, uh, a picture from a Christopher Nolan film called The Prestige. And you know, it's easy enough for me to tell you how to be creative and try and get you into the minds of these three individuals. But it, a really good way is to show you using the ingredients, the cocktail, sorry, that we showed you today. We could have brought you out the cocktail just in the classic cap glass. It's still delicious. It's great. Fantastic. Because the idea is, is uh, with a Rubikism, Rubikism, I like it. <laughs> uh, hashtag, hashtag Rubikism, hashtag tell the cocktail. <laughs> What every drink sort of that is driven by each of these movements, I believe, comes down to three major acts. And this is me completely stealing from the Christmas Vanilla film. The first is the pledge. You've got this, you know what it is. Everyone's been getting these sample cups this whole week. Great, cool, it's a drink, it's got a bit of mint in it. Mmm, chicken essence, great. You're getting something that you already expect to know and you're surprised by the ingredients. So, the pledge, first act. Second thing, you get the drink, this is the turn. 
You get the drink in this weird pill bottle. You're like, what the hell? Did someone urinate in that? Am I in an old sports home? <laughs> so that's the turn. You're already intrigued from visually. You're like, ooh, cool. Ah, oh, it's a cocktail. And you've got the ingredients. And third, and last but not least, this is the turn. You've got a Angus, oh, I put that on upside down. You've got the ingredients list. Now, the whole aspect comes together as once. Now we're throwing it at the wall for dynamic uh, effect. Um, now you've got something that has, is unique to this moment. Now you've created a particular moment just between the drink and yourself. Especially now when we've got 200 people in this room and we don't have a time to sit there and talk to you individually, you're gonna get it. So we've created what's this called? The Prestige. See? Uh, <laughs> um, which is, you, you're getting it, you understand it, it is not urine, you know the ingredients, it's chicken essence, it's better. <laughs> and then you shake it, so it's, it's, we've managed to sort of hit home with what we were trying to explain in a 200 people seminar made by some caps with a serve like this. And crushed ice. And crushed <laughs> ice. <laughs> the aviary wasn't willing to give us five of their ice guys. <laughs> <laughs> They've got money, but they ain't no charity. That's got a lot of chicken. So, mmm, chicken. Um, Dan, we could do questions now if you're almost questions? done. We can do questions. Yeah, I'm just going to sort of tie it all cool. together. Tie it am, I, am I clown noise? Yeah, you got one minute. I got one minute. So, I got 66 to go. Um, so, we have our broken Rubik's Cube. We've got all six toilet sides to our drink. We understand that we need to hit home. <laughs> we understand that we need to make sure that every side of that is perfect. And we need to understand that we have a purpose of where we're trying to go with this drink. And we now have an example of how we already nailed our ingredients. We already nailed our, our serve. And we knew what we were trying to do is make you feel uncomfortable. Uh, insert urine joke here. Um, with the label. Guys, thank you very much. Uh, for I hope that that sort of interaction and explanation has really broken down the creative process, in my opinion, of how to make drinks in the avant-garde shake the box style of style. And then you can take that idea behind you and break it down the way we just have and be able to come up with avant-garde cocktails yourself wherever you are, home, bar, brand ambassador meeting. Thank or you. homeless. Or homeless. <laughs>
So it's try to make sure you're safe because you don't want to get your caught in, in a scandal somewhere and you'll have to get shut down. But always go to a professional and someone who's worked with it before. Yeah, we don't want to make anyone sick. Yeah. And if you are using an ingredient that's, that's slightly toxic, I think labeling it such on the menu is really important and that's a whole other seminar. Um, and an, an important one too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Be transparent with those ingredients. Yeah. Let, peop let people know and, um, tr and really you have to be humble about it. If you're not comfortable in understanding and extracting the ingredient pro the right way, don't do it. Just don't do it. Yeah, just, just be very mindful that you know, people trust us in our bars to be doing the right thing. So we need to keep that trust high. So yeah. that's the best thing. If it's a recognizable food, then you're probably safe. If it's something that's medicinal, it can have probably like um, too much or too less or you know, much bigger implication for your health. Can I also jump in here? The last year, Camper English did a seminar specifically on this topic. Um, if you haven't heard of him, academics.com, reach out to him because there's a Facebook group in the States all about um, dangerous ingredients mm. and being careful about them. So a just check it out. Glass is a really good resource. Yeah, yeah, he's, they did it together, I think. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. So we, we kind of live in an age where millennials are looking for uh, like one button conveniency and streamlining the process. A lot of you talk about uh, kind of novelty of experience, sometimes being emotionally challenging. Do you think that the pendulum will swing in the next 10 to 20 years where we're exploring cocktail forms that, that try to be, as a face of the this year, intuitive? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. Did everybody hear that? When are you using it? I'm going to bring you the mic because that was interesting. Good, good question. <laughs> this is Anya. Thank you. Sure. So uh, my question was uh, that several of our panelists have discussed the emotionally challenging or kind of novelty basis of the experience. And, and when we think about uh, other technologies or other experiences today, there's a streamlining of process, uh, a simplicity of technology where people kind of want a one click and there it is. So I'm wondering, as the pendulum kind of tends to move back and forth with trends, do any of our panelists foresee a move towards innovation and in intuitiveness of experience rather than kind of the surprise? Okay, well, psychology, a psychology major. major? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think By the way, your voice is very sexy. <laughs> very soothing. She's taking my answer. <laughs> I, I think your, your pendulum metaphor is very apt, because uh, it is something which tends to sort of bounce off each other. We will often go through times where things are meant to be very kind of like straightforward, simple, you know, kind of to the beat, towards going completely wacky and then back again. It really is a pendulum. Um, the, the key often for people in today is to like interface that more with what is currently on trend. So little jokes about pop culture, little pieces of symbolism, those, those are always going to hit now and completely miss later unless your demographic evolves with it. But generally speaking, as I say, the, the pendulum thing is the right way to look at it in that it will bounce between simplicity and what well, haven't got. That's a good answer. Questions? Yes. Actually, based on that answer, how do you know when to pull the plug? Or you had mentioned, my guess, some, some earlier fails and things like that. So besides just using sales mix of what's selling and what's not, how, A, how are you getting that customer feedback? And B, when do you know to... to when something's jumped the shark? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, we just trash stuff after like six months because we get bored of it anyways. Um, but no, I think it's, it's just being aware of, you know, like that's part of the experience thing is, is you only know the trends if you experience the trends. There's only so much that you can actually research, but you're not going to actually experience those things unless you go to bars and, and, and do it. So I think that's a big part of it is just being aware of what bars around you are doing. Um, and that doesn't necessarily say that you have to follow exactly what they're doing, but it's a, it's a good symbol if, you know, five out of seven places are doing something, that it's a trend. So that's, for me, is, is just always, you know, like, you'll know it when a trend's over because they start dropping off menus and it becomes a little cliche, so I think that's it. People stop ordering that drink, yeah. you know. It's also quite rare that these things actually happen. It's quite rare that trends really do disappear. Like, especially in the course of like a menu, unless something crazy happens overnight and you think, shit, I really got to change everything on the menu. It doesn't really happen. Like, you can usually plan well in advance for that and just think, right, this menu's going to run for six months. 
Also, I think that, Michael, you did a really great job at repurposing the branding technique. So branding is really done quite heavily for a long time, but taking that trend and turning it into something new or putting a spin on it, I really like that idea. So you can extend trends that way as well and sort of make it your own. That's, that's a really nice way of sort of protecting yourself from the trend downfall. You can elongate that trend and still make it new for your guests. Cool, we've got time for one more quick question. We've got one minute. Yes. Um, I was just asking, so you say you make a liqueur ice. Is that correct? The liqueur ice, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so like you're saying you're really averse to crushed ice. How are you going to play? So I got the dilution of liqueur ice. Um, dilution of like the alcohol content? Uh, well, so a lot of that's specialty equipment um, and, and trial and error. So we, we run the same recipe anywhere from five to ten times to see what, you know, the, the texture is and the freezing point and the melting point and making sure it actually is going to work. Um, but, you know, beyond that, it's like it's putting it into effect. And then um, there's, there's science behind it, you know, like you can figure out with math what the ABV of your ice is and if it's going to freeze. Um, but more than anything, we just do trial and error because I don't like. Yeah, well, I mean, so it's never the alcohol content of the ice is never going to be equal to or higher than an ideal cocktail. So it's definitely still going to dilute. Um, it's going to dilute slower and it's going to dilute more flavorful. So it's not necessarily diluting with alcohol, but it's more just there to help the ice melt faster in a lot of ways so that people drink faster and they order another drink. Uh, Clever. <laughs> well, thank you. And you guys have been a great audience. This has been so much fun. Thanks for coming. Thank you guys.